Hi, you're listening to The Sociology Show, a podcast about absolutely anything to do with the wonderful world of sociology. Whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, a student, or just taking a passing interest, this podcast will look at a range of issues from social class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, crime, education, and anything else that sociology has to offer. My name is Matthew Wilkin, and in each episode, I will speak to someone working in the field of sociology and let them explain all about their own interests, their research, and their experiences. So, put your earphones in, turn the volume up, and let's be sociology geeks together, eh? My guest for this week was Professor Louise Archer from UCL. Uh, Louise is a sociologist that looks at education and inequality. Uh, Many of you will have heard of her work, but she covers all different areas, looking at social class, um, gender and ethnicity. A lot of her work at the moment is to do with STEM subjects and why uh, many girls are often not going into those subjects. She's also looked at Muslim students in terms of attitudes and performance in education. And she's also looked at a lot of ideas to do with social class, setting and streaming in schools and why we have such different performance between a range of different students. So I found this a really interesting interview. I hope you enjoy it. Let's have a listen. Thank you for uh, taking the time to talk to the podcast. Would you like to start by introducing yourself, please? Hi, I'm Louise Archer, and I'm the Carl Mannheim Professor of Sociology of Education at UCL Institute of Education in London. Thank you, Louise. And uh, what's your background in sociology? Did you study it yourself at school and college and on to degree and so on? Yeah, I, I took sociology A level, and it was it was just an eye opener. I absolutely loved it. I thought there was no other subject I'd ever done where each week I felt like my whole world view was being turned upside down. Brilliant. Um, just helped me look at the world in a different way. Um, so I really enjoyed sociology A level um, for reasons that I can't quite work out now. I decided not to take it as a degree. I actually took social psychology oh, right. as an undergraduate degree. Although social psychology is quite close to, to sociology. So um, so I enjoyed that degree. I took sociology modules within it. So I remember studying the sociology of the family with the PALS um, back in the day. And yeah. um, then after that, I, did an un, uh, I went on to do a PhD. And I did that. It was in social psychology, but it was quite sociological in that it was looking at its um, using discourse analysis. And it was looking at the identities and experiences of British Muslim people. So slowly over the years, I've kind of come back towards sociology. Yeah. Uh, What university were you at for your degree? I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Kent, at Canterbury, and then I did my PhD at Greenwich University. I see. And when when you were studying sociology, was there a particular sociologist or a theory which really inspired you? What what really grabbed you, got your interest? Well, I loved it all, to be honest. Um, I really... I suppose I've always quite liked education, always liked the sociology of education, but I did like it all. I, I remember really liking um, sociology of crime and deviance and uh, the media, I think, which uh, is always fascinating. Sociology of youth um, and youth subcultures I really loved as well. I suppose that's continued with me, that all my research since has always focused on young people. Yeah, and you, men- you mentioned education. Would you say that's your, your main area of research? Yes, yes, all of our work's in education, both in what we call formal education, so schools, colleges, universities, um, but also informal, so um, out-of-school settings where learning takes place as well. Yeah. Um, what would what would people best know you for? What's your greatest hits, Louise? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, I suppose when when we uh, go and meet um, sociology A-level students, I suppose they tend to know the work that's on the syllabus. So um, some people study the British Muslim um, people's work and uh, quite a lot on the... Um, the youth identities, so young people feeling that university is not for them and investment in Nike identities uh, as it's called and uh, young women in schooling. So um, I'd say that's probably for it's sociology a level, I think, the work that gets covered most. But out of, out of that area, we've done a lot of work recently on inequalities in um, engagement with science among young people. Yeah, and you, you mentioned inequalities. You cover all areas, don't you? So you look at social class and ethnicity and gender. Yes, so we'd like to try and take an intersectional uh, approach um, that tries to take account of all, all, all different social inequalities and identities like class, race, gender. 
And I wanted to, wanted to pick up on, on some of those because um, watching some of your YouTube clips and videos, uh, you're quite influenced by Pierre Bourdieu. Is that is that true? Yes. So we do we do use. Uh, I like to use a range of theorists, but I have used Bourdieu a lot. Um, he he's got a massive uh, back catalogue, so there's plenty there to to use. Um, obviously, he had a very long career, so I find his concepts really really useful and, and helpful. Um, but I think they still work. They still, um, no one theorist does it all. Yeah. So we still use Bourdieu um, with other theorists. So particularly for me, feminist theorists and critical race theorists. So Bourdieu was great on class. I don't think anyone can sort of doubt that. But he was not, in my view, so good on gender or ethnicity and race. So I think there's always, um, you know, we can't expect anyone to do it all. So sure. I like to say. <laughs> I would like to talk, if, if possible, about those two areas in particular that you just mentioned, social class and, and gender. Maybe we could start with social class. Um, would you say that is still the biggest factor that determines success or failure in education for students? I think it's undoubtedly a huge factor. Social class makes such a difference. But it's not just class alone. And I think that's the importance for us of taking an intersectional approach. So, for example, even uh, we did a, I did a study a number of years back on the minority ethnic middle classes. And you could say, well, yes, a lot of them get on very well. You know, they've got middle class, what Bourdieu would call capital. Uh, but the intersection with the race was really important. So the young people that we spoke to still experienced a lot of racism. And their parents talked about issues around racism too. So race can, you know, very much, in, let's say, interfere with class in that respect. It can constrain class privilege, which means that being a black middle class person is very different to being a white middle class person. Yeah. And this is perhaps a too big a question, um, but what, why do you think social class has such a significant impact on educational success? Uh, I think there, there are lots of reasons. So obviously, at the level of what resources you have, so what Bourdieu would talk about is you know having what money you've got, economic capital, makes a difference. Whether you can afford um, to, you know, lots of middle class families with lots of money move into desirable school areas, or if they can't get the school they want, they can choose private schooling. So they can, money makes a difference as to the opportunities and experiences you have. But also, well, from a Bourdieu perspective, your, your cultural capital, so your cultural knowledge and your social capital, your contacts, who you know. So a lot of the research shows that middle class families use all of these forms of advantage to get on and quote unquote play, play the education system better. So they, you know, their children can get the best educational opportunities they have knowledge that helps them work the system. They have social contacts who can facilitate them into particular careers. So I think all of these things make a difference. But also what our research shows is that at that level of prejudice and stereotyping as well, unfortunately, often teachers unwittingly have different expectations of different students across race, class and gender. And these are still an issue today as much as they've ever been. Yeah, so it's kind of a combination of old boys network, social capital, cultural capital. Yeah, so again, for example, in some of the research we've done with minority ethnic young people, they and their families tell us about how teachers mates um, have lower expectations of them or expect them to, to do an average uh, rather than being at the very best and the top, and why shouldn't they? So all of, all of these inequalities come together. There's no one way in which it causes it. It plays out across multiple levels to make it really quite um, powerful and enduring. So. We know that young people from, whether it's working class backgrounds, um, minority ethnic backgrounds, um, those who do well are working often, it's a triple achievement. They're overcoming a lot more. It's a lot harder to achieve and to keep achieving than it is from if you're a very privileged white middle class background. And you mentioned something, remind me of the term, symbolic violation, is that right? Oh, symbolic violence, yes. Yeah, yeah. Could you just expand on what what that means? Because I thought that was a really interesting concept. Yeah, so this is this is Bourdieu's idea. Uh, so the idea of symbolic violence is that inequalities play out in a way that the people who are um, the, the disadvantaged don't necessarily notice it's happening. So um, the, well, I've used the term in relation to a study we did on setting, and I talked to I wrote a paper called the symbolic violence of setting, and it's the idea that it's the power of social reproduction is that we don't even, we, we accept it as just the way it is. So it's the idea that the people, uh, we come to believe that the people in the top sets are there not because 
of their it's a social advantage, but because they deserve it, they are naturally cleverer. And the people in the bottom sets, that's just where they belong. And for Bourdieu, this is the way that we, we don't then challenge inequalities because we've been socialised to believe that that's the way it is, and that's the symbolic violence. So I talk about it in the, the paper how setting is actually a, a technique, a tool of privilege, of reproduction. So it means that more, uh, more socially advantaged families do very well out of setting. <clears throat> if you look at who tends to argue for setting in schools, it's the white middle class parents because white middle class children disproportionately end up in the set. And some of our analyses uh, on that project showed that there's a disproportionate allocation of black uh, working class um, boys to the lower set and white working class boys, irrespective, which is not strictly in, always in line with their attainment. So it's it's seen as a natural thing, but actually it's a very powerful tool of reproduction. Yeah, and I think you said that actually evidence does show that setting doesn't doesn't work. Is that right? Yeah, well, setting, yeah, the wider evidence suggests that setting overall doesn't really have any particular, um, it, it doesn't help, and it's bad. It, it has a very, very minor uh, effect for those in the top sets, but it's really problematic and bad for those in the lower sets. And people can come to... You know, the young people we talk to in the lower sets don't really like being there. They feel yeah. looked down on. And you often um, don't always get the same quote-unquote quality of teachers. Um, so, so they get a, an impoverished curriculum. So it's not it, it's not something that helps people um, graze up out of the bottom sets and do better. It's very problematic. But the we did find it, I did find with that paper, it, it kicked up the, uh, the biggest... Uh, Twitter storm of, of any of my research has yeah. ever done because people came out uh, sort of right wing people came out very much in favour of uh, of setting yeah um, ideologically it, it's uh, an ideological hot potato let's say <laughs> yeah I remember I've, I've worked at various secondary schools I won't mention any but I remember for maths for example they used to put the strongest most academic teacher with the top set. Yeah. The, the the teacher who could control groups at the bottom set, and then the middle groups just got filled up with whoever else was left. So it seems yeah. quite unfair on the middle groups as well. Yeah, and I think it's interesting to note as well that we're very wedded to setting in Britain, and, and I'd say as a form of symbolic violence, we think, well, that's just the way you have to teach math. But actually, when um, you look at other countries, and they, not every country uses setting. No. And it's actually that when we've looked in some of our research around in the context of science that young people's attitudes to science you see that in schools that set those in the top sets have as you predict the, the most positive attitudes to science and then it goes down with those in the bottom sets the, the least positive but in schools that don't set the average uh, attitudes to science are the same statistically as they are in schools where there are top sets yeah so if we got rid of setting we i think we'd have a, a you know much more um positive engagement yeah certainly would be a good good starting point wouldn't it yeah and um, <laughs> Are you happy to move on to, to gender to talk about that, that yeah. a little bit more? Um, yeah. What was your main research to do with gender and inequality found? Um, maybe we could start from the girls' side, if that's okay. Gender is threaded through all the research we yeah. do. So I can't think of, like, there's not one study where we've only foregrounded gender, but we've always tried to look at it in combination. But let me have a think. Um, I was going to, if, if you don't mind me saying that, something that I was interested in, you were talking about um, female attitudes towards STEM subjects or taking physics, for example. Quite often yeah. they're put off doing it at A level, even if they're quite successful at GCSE. I found that really interesting. Yes, thank you. Good prompt. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I, we're particularly interested in physics because there's such a low, a small proportion of girls that continue with physics. And a lot of the, there's a lot of money put into this area trying to change that, but a lot of the interventions to date have always focused on trying to change the girls. So we tried to look at this in more detail, more sociologically. And we actually found that there's a lot of work done by the education system to basically put girls off and to stop them continuing. Yeah. So our, 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 our finding, our, really our recommendation for that is that we need to stop trying to change girls and start trying to change the education system. For example, physics does a lot, a lot of what Bourdieu would call pedagogic work. So um, through sort of subtle and not so subtle ways, it sends all these signals constantly through um, the curricula, through teaching practice, all of the, uh, through popular culture. So like Sheldon on the Big Bang Theory, yeah. everywhere we've got ideas that tell us that physicists are very clever, geeky white males. Yeah. 
make it very difficult for young women who really like the actual physics, are very interested in it, to see themselves as viable, authentic physicists. Uh, so we, we see over time, we've got a, a longitudinal study that's tracked young people from the age of 10 now up to 23. And you can see over time, even when girls really like physics, they're constantly having to do a lot of identity work to manage these contradictions. Um, and this idea that, because this idea of the Sheldon character as being the, the classic physicist, it feels that if you have to do a lot of work and you're working hard, that somehow that's not a proper physicist. And we think it's those ideas around physics that needs changing rather than trying to make more girls necessarily like physics. Yeah, that was something I was really interested in, you said that some girls, it might have been one girl in particular, said that she didn't want to do it because she thought it would be too hard or she thought it was a hard subject, even though she was successful at GCSE and, and often top of the class. Um, yes. Is that something common that you see that, that females underestimate ability or or their beliefs at all? Yeah, so so the, the one you're talking about, the example of um, the young woman that's given the pseudonym of Kate in our study, so... She was, she was literally the highest attaining student in our, in our whole sample. And she liked physics, but she felt that doing a degree in it would be too hard. So it made us really stop and think of, well, who, who can do it? And I think it's that very powerful combination of that gendered notion of the physicist um, that makes young women doubt themselves. Yeah. And it's not that they don't have the capability at all. It's that notion of physics and engineering, subjects like that, are incredibly gendered very much um, and particularly in England again if you look at international data other countries don't have quite the same as powerful some countries don't have such a powerful association of for example um, you know masculinity and engineering or masculinity and physics and you see higher rates of women participating in those countries so it's an interesting way that the culture sets this up and comes to think that that's that's just how we do it and we all get socialized into believing that yeah I'd, so I'd... Sorry, I was, was going. Yeah, sorry. No, I was going to say I teach a teacher at an international school. Um, mm. A lot of the Asian students, Sing Singaporean students, Chinese students, they were quite surprised by that because the girls are not put off by science subjects at all. In fact, they're they're flourishing. So yeah, I think there probably is some cultural differences there. Yeah, I mean, and we were very struck that even um, uh, we had students telling us that, for example, one of the young women who, who liked science told us that when she went to an A level choice evening. Um, uh, 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 the teacher they're talking to said, um, "Oh, well, you need a, you know, you need a boy brain to study maths and physics." Or all my, to all the girls who study physics are tomboys. And this was in a very um, pro-science, independent girls' school. Mm. And we're struck. Well, if it's happening there, you know, it, it is happening everywhere. And and part of the issue for us is that teachers and members of society, like everyone else, they they see the same Sheldon um, stereotypes as yeah. everyone else, but also. The more our research suggests, the more you continue in science, the more you get socialised into that mindset. So why should our physics teachers, when we're not giving them any, um, they've got no sociology. They need the sociology of gender. To yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. How, how can they be expected to, uh, to challenge it? And when we look at our data, at who were the the most uh, stereotypical uh, students? Those who expressed the most stereotypical views about scientists. So those who are most likely to say scientists are odd, male, and geeky. It was high level physics students. So presumably some of the physics teachers of the future. Yes. And you also mentioned something about masculinised language or the way of saying something with authority to do it with science. Yeah, so we, we've um, we spent a lot of time sitting in science and physics classrooms and struck that in some, sometimes the, the, the ways that get it, um, legitimated or seen as this is how you're a proper science student are often quite masculine, so being very assertive competitive we've seen and this is the boys doing it again yeah. coming back to our point about changing the culture of the classroom rather than changing the girls so we we often see in physics classrooms boy in mixed classrooms boys will be the ones who are shouting out the answers who are talking over girls sometimes correcting girls terminology yeah and again we see that as because of the very strong association of physics with masculinity in in our culture yeah, uh, the numbers are changing though. I see a uh, number of STEM student, female STEM students increasing. Numbers increase, but the proportions don't change radically. Right. So it's still an issue. It's still something that's very, very much needing to be tackled. But we have seen that in schools that take um, a very strong um, approach to trying to tackle gender in gender in, in, in inequality, 
uh, who adopt like a whole school gendered approach. Research from the Institute of Physics shows that they really do turn around the proportion of girls studying physics and boys studying subjects like French and modern foreign languages. Yeah, and if we if we move on to boys, actually, because you just mentioned what's what's your research telling us about boys? Because we know that they are. Um, lagging behind girls from SATs level, GCSE up to A level. Uh, what, what's going on there? I think it depends on which boys you're talking yeah. about. So, for example, white middle class boys have always done quite well. Yeah. And they're not the ones who are underachieving. Really, you're talking about white and black working class boys. So I think that's always important within debates about gender that we do unpick. Right? Because some girls are achieving yeah. and some girls yeah. are not achieving in the, in the same way. Um, so we are. Inter- I've been very interested over the years in under- trying to understand issues of masculinity and how those intersect with, with race and class. So again, when we're talking about the reasons for boys' so-called underachievement, there are issues of class injustice and, and racial injustice coming in there too that also affect it along with gender. Yeah, and when you're talking about working class boys in, in particular, is there still a a stereotype um you know being called a sissy or that education is effeminate or the expectations to misbehave is is that still existing yeah so um and lots of my colleagues have done done a research around this showing that this idea of of education being associated with sort of being feminized and it being uncool to work so that if you do work you keep it a bit more undercover um is sort of is still an issue I know Becky Francis did some some really interesting work around laddishness yeah. um, a number of years back. So it'd be interesting to see the extent to which that still plays out today. But I think those I don't think we've radically shifted ideas of masculinity in our society. So um, you know, there's still ideas of masculinity being associated with being tough and um, and so on. But there's also different sorts of mas- different ver- ways of doing masculinity. So among some um, you know, middle class boys, it, this idea of um, muscular intellect, uh, as it's been called, is, is can be very be seen as desirable and cool. So the idea of being like you're, you're sort of Jeremy, you Jeremy Paxman type yeah. figure, um, you know, very sharp and slightly intellectually aggressive. So again, there's not one masculine, not one version of masculinity that everybody performs all of the time. Yeah. And, and and what about ethnicity? If we complete the set, we've talked about class and and gender. What what's your research found in terms of why ethnic groups often perform at quite differing levels in education? Yeah. So again, I think it's it's complex. There's this intersection with class as well. That's, yeah. that's important there, and with gender. It's so for example, uh, Becky Francis and I did a study a number of years back on the British Chinese who tend to achieve very highly in in the British education system. We we're interested in trying to unpick why that is and again it's 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 the classic sociological answer it's all very complex of course but there's this intersection of being uh, of family discourses yeah. so the idea of um doing it for your family and family sort of social competition to achieve parents really doing putting so much into supporting the education of their children working all hours trying to make sure they've got everything that they could possibly you know, um, all the chances they could have to succeed. And I think to the British Chinese as well, being in a minority of minorities um, often makes a difference too. But also we found these sort of different um, teacher expectations. So teachers were more likely to expect Chinese students to do well, but at the same time, there would be these um, stereotypes that maybe they're not doing it in quite the right way. So they're too passive would be often teachers would talk about or they're like educational machines who just keep learning and learning they don't ask enough questions in class so again even where um groups like the British Chinese achieve we we wanted to draw attention to how they're still having to work really hard because there's still issues of racism that they're having to overcome um in relation to that yeah so how, how much of it I'm just thinking about that how much of educational success is about effort meritocracy <laughs> Uh, <laughs> not as much as there should. I, yeah. I, think, I think the across the board, um, the evidence shows that people do succeed against the odds, but they have to work so hard and have. You, you need the capital and the resource and the context that supports and facilitates that. I think we do. We have a very unequal education system yeah. in Britain. Uh, we don't have. Not all schools are the same. Schools are very differently resourced. Um, 
so so yeah everyone's at, it's very much an uneven playing field everyone's at different starting points and has different hurdles as well so it's um it's much more i'd say uh exemplifying pierre bourdieu's theory of social reproduction than going against it yeah and, and a lot of people will be familiar with your work to do with with muslim students could you tell us a little bit more about that yeah so this so this work was done quite a long time ago now um well it was a long time ago um so it's interesting that I, I did that research in the wake of the Salman Rushdie affair, which was um, at the end of at the end of the eighties, and yeah. then I did my research in the early nineties, which then, in a sense, has um, reflected more recent um, large scale issues around Islamophobia as well. So, in a sense, it's my research is dated now, but it's it's still trying to understand how young people, young British Muslim people, construct their identities in the face of quite widespread societal Islamophobia. Yeah. But I think what I, I thought, well, some of the things that we found interesting in that research was tr- particularly the unpicking of masculinity and saying that a lot of what the young boys, uh, young men were talking about was as much them performing masculinity as if it was them performing racialized or Islamic mas- uh, identities. Uh, so they were, um, we, we were trying to suggest that young people shouldn't only be seen through one lens. It's not all just about uh, religion or race, but it's also the intersection with class and gender as well. That's that's really coming through in everything you're saying, that actually we can't just look at one issue independently, can we, in terms of gender or social class, ethnicity? They all correlate. Yeah, I think I think if you if you only use one lens, then you, you miss a lot of what's going on. And, and we know from wider research that, you know, we, there's not one black experience but the yeah. black masculinity and black femininity and then bringing class into that as well means that actually people's experiences and their identities are are multifaceted and if we're going to understand the working of inequalities we have to be able to unpick these different aspects i wanted to ask you louise i got a question from one of my a-level students and they said what type of sociologist is archer they always, they always quite like to pigeonhole. Is, is she a feminist? Is she a Marxist? Is she a Marxist feminist? What type of feminist? Oh, wow. They're always obsessed with this question. What, how, yeah. would you answer that? how would you answer that? Oh, I, I, I don't think I am one sort of... Um, yeah. I don't think I am one sort of sociologist. Um, I think it's interesting the way that... Maybe it's the way that the curriculums get set up that people think everyone's in one, one yeah. camp, but actually we're not. And I... It's probably like people in real life, you know, no one's one sort of anything. Yeah. Um, I would say that, but, but to try and answer the question in a more helpful way, um, I, usually I use things like critical feminist sociologist uh, or sociologist of education um, because I do like to, I see it's, um, you know, it's critical theory, so not, um, not one particular, but I think that notion of an intersectional, an intersectional uh, Attempt at sociology. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what type of methods do you do you tend to use? Are you a, an interviewer or a observations? Well, we use um, mixed methods um, a lot. So a lot of my um, research that people might be more familiar with on, from the sociology A level tends to be qualitative research. Yeah. So I've done a lot of qualitative research, but definitely in the last um, over ten years, I found mixed methods research really powerful. So I like that combination of we. Particularly if you want to affect policy, having a large scale survey data sitting in the background is really, really helpful because policymakers like to take notice of numbers. For us, we can't understand those numbers without the qualitative richness and complex that gives you that complexity behind that. But in our qualitative, so, so we, view, we use surveys, but we also um, use lots of qualitative, so interviews, discussion groups. Um, also, we do. I've been getting, uh, well, I did it with the British Muslim research as well, but using a range of more expressive methods. So young people do use um, tablets and videos and photos and a whole range of um, more, what we often call more sort of um, expressive qualitative methods too. And those can give you really, really rich data. So one study we've got going currently with young people in um, who attend a digital arts centre some of the young men there really don't like interviews. They don't like oh, expressing themselves verbally. Yeah. And they like to make computer animations and things like that. Or, so we're interested in different methods that help young people express identity in a whole range of ways, not just verbally. And who, who else do you work with? Which other names of sociologists might have some of the students or listeners heard of? 
Well, I've got a long history of working with Becky Francis, yeah. who's also a really good friend of mine. And I've got colleagues that I've not on particular projects with, I've got um, colleagues like Carol Vincent at, at the Institute. Um, currently, I've, I work with a lot of people. So the way I work is I like to work in teams. So people often think of the lone sociologist, but I really <laughs> like team working. So we, we, I've got um, lots of people on my teams that I work with. Um, and I've also worked with people internationally too, uh, across different disciplines. So I've got people with sort of psychology backgrounds on our teams, um, social practice backgrounds. So I've got colleagues in the States who are more ethnographers. And I find that um, that's a really rich way of working. It just helps you look at a problem from lots of different angles. And that's good. That's good for... Uh... For people to know, because like you said, we often think of the the lone sociologist <laughs> rather than What's working. That, wearing, from... wearing our corduroy, stretching yeah, our beards. That's it. And <laughs> what what are you working on at the moment, Louise? What's your current uh, research? So, so currently, I've got four large studies, and they all are looking at issues around inequalities in young people engaging with science and technology and engineering. So we've got the project that I referred to before, where we track young people. It's a longitudinal mixed method study tracking them from 10 they're now in the 20 to 23 age range that's a nice one we've got and then we've got a range of projects working with teachers in schools to try and say how do we support young people uh, and build their capital and then we've got projects that look at out of school learning spaces as well so how do young people um what what how, what, what's equitable practice in how young people can engage with science and technology through Settings like community zoos, digital art centres, coding clubs, places like that. Um, I'm going to let you go in a moment because I know you're extremely busy. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to ask where uh, people can get in contact to read more of your work, look at your studies. Do you have a blog or any other social media? Where else can they find out more information about you, Louise? Yes, we've got um, Twitter accounts and web pages and blogs for all of our different projects. Um, I am I'm a, a, a I'm not very technological myself, so I have really cool young folk who, who run the Twitter accounts for me, because yeah. <laughs> I'm very old, old school. Um, but yeah, I, I probably could send you the, t- the Twitter handles separately. I can't remember them off the top of my That's head. That's great. Yeah, I can, I can tweet those out for you. That would be, that'd be great. That'd be yeah. yeah, but people, yeah, we, people are very welcome to contact us. We love, we love that. And we've also got one, um, sociology, the sociology uh, uh, as well that we run from our centre, which has all the people at the Institute who do sociology of education in relation to equity. So I can share that with you too. And we run a, we run a conference every year for sociology A-level students to come, come to when we have, it's a free conference to attend. So I can send you details of that if you oh, don't have it already. Brilliant. Yeah. What sort of time of year is that? Uh, it tends to be around January and uh, it's free. We have up to a thousand people can come and it's, uh, it's always good fun. We had Paul Gilroy, Becky oh, Francis, yes. myself, Carol Vincent talking this year. That would be brilliant. I'm sure my students would love to hear you speak yeah. in person. That would be great. You're very welcome. Thank you. Professor Louise Archer, thank you very much for your interview and giving up for your, your time for today. Thank you. Good luck to all your students too. Lovely. Thank you. Cheers, Louise. Bye now. Bye. 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 Thank you for taking the time to listen to the podcast. If you would like to contact the show or be interviewed, then please email the Podcast at gmail.com.